This never looks nice on anyone. Who thought of this? Like, what were they thinking? They were like, this is a nice drink rest or something. Hi, it's Oddly Noted. Thank you so much for hanging in with us. And we're sorry that it's taken us so long. But if you know us, we're in a doctoral program and this is our third year. It's our final year, thankfully. So it's our, my goodness, part of the requirements for the Doctorate of Musical Arts in Violin Performance. Wow, that's a mouthful. Is that you have to take a comprehensive exam, wringing out your brain of the 24 years of information that you've been soaking up. Very intense. I'm not looking forward to it. After about 50 years of studying for it, ugh, I got tired of looking up books and note cards and so I did what everyone else does and relied on YouTube. There's actually a lot of helpful videos and funny videos to help people remember things for the bar exams, the NCLEX, the medical exams, things like that. But not for violin performance, unfortunately. There's some pretty dry history of violin things for the like in 1564. So I'm hoping to help future doctoral students and master students and undergrads and also just violinists in general learn about this stuff because it's interesting, it's fascinating, it's kind of funny. Most of my information will be coming from the Cambridge Companion for Violin and the Oxford and Grove Music Online resources. So let's start. Long, long ago and far, far away. Kind of like a combination of Star Wars and Suzuki. We begin our story for the violin in 1900 AD, which is the first time we see evidence of bowed instruments. Everything before that was plucked. We have four different categories of instrument. We have the rebec, which is a pear-shaped instrument with a very long neck. We have the medieval and renaissance fiddles, which came about in the 1100s, where the top string was a melody and the rest of the strings were drones. It was very, very boxy. <laughs> It also had a very flat fingerboard and bridge. Next we have the Lira de Brasio. Just a little side note, I apologize for any mispronunciation. I apologize for any mispronunciations on my part. So I'm going to try my best and if I get something wrong, please leave a comment down below. A nice comment. Hey, I'll be learning with you. Lira de Brasio. Brachio. I usually call this the Lira de Broccoli. The Lira de Brasio is the closest relative or parent to the violin. It has seven strings. And you thought a five string electric violin was fancy? <laughs> With two of them running parallel to the neck. The neck. It actually had the same playing position as the violin, which is up near the neck area. Hey, don't fret about it, because it didn't have any frets. The viol traveled from Italy to Spain in the 1490s. It also had a flat top and was held upright like a cello. These instruments developed over time. Luthiers or luthiers or luthiers. Uh, my violin maker is going to kill me. Luthier. Luthier? Oh, ugh. I think I'll go with luthier. Luthiers or makers of stringed instruments added, subtracted, changed around, colored things, etc. Looking for instruments with unique sounds and timbres. Not timbers, timbres. Ah, that's hilarious. These stringed instruments were all flat. And if you have multiple strings with a flat instrument, you get a lot of drone because the bow has to play all of the strings. This is one of the main reasons that the violin came about because they were like, I want to play some more individual strings here. How is this going to work? Fast forward to 1508, we finally see evidence in Italian art of a bowed instrument that looks a little different. It's played by an angel. These Venetian viols began to incorporate a curved top and bridge, which led to play individual strings. Curved. They had to give the instrument extra support on the insides, which is where the modern violin gets the bass bar. A bass and a violin walk into a bar. Now you may think that the violin was some sort of unique, special, miraculous invention, but in reality, the viol, the lira, the violin, the viola, the cello, they were all developed simultaneously. We shall have to continue a little further to see why the violin was the one to make the mad dash ahead of the others. The earliest surviving violin we have is from 1564, and you can find a gorgeous picture of it on the Tuli, Tuli, sorry, Tuli House website. The link is in the description. As someone who has fondness for older things, it's beautiful. This 1564 violin was made by Andrea Amati. 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 The violin was one of 38 instruments commissioned by Charles IX of France. I wouldn't mind having 38 violins. Now, these early instruments came from three major hotspots of production, Cremona, Brescia, 
and Venice. Why? Because Venice's economy was up, 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 and there was a demand for courtly entertainment because they didn't have TVs or iPhones or Pokemon Go. Luthiers at this time would make all sorts of stringed instruments, not just the violin. The popularity of the instrument really results from a combination of people wanting to play it, pieces written for the instrument, people teaching the instrument making part, and pedagogy, or people teaching the instrument to other performers, which results in more people playing it and more demand for the instrument, etc., etc. Another element that led to the popularity of the instrument is the construction. By carving out the front and the back, the violin morphed into a much bigger powerhouse. Did you know that the first violins had only three strings? The E string was eventually added to G, D, and A, resulting in a wider range and generations of older siblings referring to their younger sister's instrument as a cat in a bread box. Did you know that the original violin was not vegan friendly? The original strings were made out of sheep gut. Yes. Intestines. During the 1500s, there was a change from twisted gut strings to rope twist gut strings, which helped improve the clarity of the D and the G. It's a gory truth. It's really... Ugh. In the 1500s, the blueprint for the instrument varied, but the Amati family instruments sort of settled the standard. You had the defined classical scroll, the single row purfling, and the channel delges, which all changed the character and the tone quality with the violin and made it a beautiful sight to behold. There were still variations to come on the intricacies of the violins, but the standardization was necessary to give makers boundaries in which to work and musicians consistent form in which to develop technique. There were some significant changes that happened later, which I will mention when we get to them. Now you may be asking yourself, what about the bow? Prior to the 1500s, performers pretty much used a curved stick. Now typically this wouldn't be a stick that you just go out into the forest and grab off a tree. They were usually shaped over some sort of apparatus to give them that special curve. You would tie a horsehair to one end, which would be the tip, and the other end you would leave just enough room to hold onto the bow. Now when I say curved stick, this is a normal bow. The curve went this way, like a rainbow. You can imagine with the high center of gravity on a curved stick, it's a wonder why bowed instruments ever evolved. During the 1500s, sticks were less curved, and little frogs were added to the handle part to lift the hair away from the stick and give performers something to hold on to. Why is it called a frog? There are many theories, but the closest one is that there's something called a frock, which is a tool that helped bow makers make the curve of the bow. What about performers, you say? Well, there were plenty of performers playing the violin in the 1500s, but as the instrument was still new, we have to travel to the 1600s to start meeting the really important performers. During this time, the violin was used for courtly entertainment and dancing for the most part. And that takes us up to the 1600s, and we will continue on the next video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. It really helps me be able to communicate these words and prepare for these exams. If you like this video and would like more of these types of videos, comment down below, like, and subscribe. It only takes a second of your time, and it means the world to YouTubers everywhere if you do. Thanks so much. See you next time. Bye-bye. I'm not so good at the cello.